Uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Brother Warren Longo. I am an Alexian brother. I've been an Alexian brother for 61 years. I entered when I was, I entered when I was uh, actually 18 years old. And uh, I think I will tell you this, because it, it, it really has meant a lot to me. I remember it every single day. You know how people have dreams? You all have dreams. Well, I was 17 and a half, and I was working in a hospital, get, paying my way through Catholic uh, high school, because my parents were poor. They couldn't afford it. So I said, well, I'll work. And he said, and someone said, there's an, uh, I work in the, the, there an opening in the kitchen at St. Mary's Hospital. So I went uh, over there and I got a job. And one evening I had this dream. And I dreamed of Jesus, literally Jesus, hunched like this with a crown of thorns on his head, with a white robe and a very heavy cross. And he was walking very slowly. And he looked back at me and I was, I went, no. And he went, like, come on, follow me. And uh, so I said, my gosh. Then what happened, what happened was I called the vocation director up in Chicago. I was from, from Racine, Wisconsin. And uh, he said, I, I said that uh, I would like to uh, put my application. He said, fine. He said, the only thing what we need at that time, the only thing that we need is a bill of good health. So go to your family doctor and get a uh, uh, you know get, get an examination, and so Dr. Buckley was the family doctor for many years. So I went there, and he uh, he said, "Let me see here." He took his stuff. He said, "He said, do you, son, he said, do you know you have a very bad heart?" I said, "What?" He said, "Yes, you have a bad heart." I said, "Oh my gosh, I didn't know I had a bad heart." And I, I just felt so, I said, oh my God. So what I did was I, uh, uh, I called Brother Allen up and I next day and I said, you know, the, the doctor said I have a bad heart so I don't think I can enter. He said, I'll tell you what you do. Get a second opinion. Racine <laughs> is only uh, an hour and a half from, from uh, Chicago. So uh, we have an emergency room at the hospital here. You just come and uh, let me know when you're gonna come. I said, I'll come tomorrow. And, uh, and then we'll have one of our doctors. So I went to the doctor, I went to the emergency room of uh, Alexian Brothers Hospital in Chicago, and the doctor, you got a good heart. I said, what? <laughs> you have a good heart. And that was due, I think, to Mary, because the day after the day that I found out that I had a bad heart, I went to uh, the church across the street from St. Mary's, Holy Name, uh, Holy Name Church, which was the, the, the church that I belonged to. And I, I went to the altar, and I, frankly, I began crying. I said, I don't understand. Jesus sort of asked me to follow him, and now I've got a bad heart, so how can I do that? And I said, you know, you, you at, the, at the wedding feast of Cana, he said it wasn't his time, but you said, go ahead and uh, do, it, do what I say. You know, get, get some good wine for, these, for the guests here. And that's what you did for me. Because after that, they couldn't find anything wrong with my heart. And here I am, 81 years old, and I still have a very good heart. <laughs> okay. Um, let me just tell you this, uh, that uh, the reason why we're having this is because, first of all, it's the 150th anniversary of the Alexian brothers here in St. Louis. The Alexian Brothers is a very uh, small order, but we originated in Germany, uh, the Rhineland. Uh, about, we are one of the oldest orders in the world. We go back about 800 years. And we always took care of people that nobody else would take care of. And, uh, and that's what we, we've done. So Brother Bonaventure Phelan came to Chicago first, and uh, he... Uh, uh, founded a hospital there, a small little clinic it was, on the corner, if you're familiar with Chicago, on the corner of Dearborn and Schiller Street in Chicago. It was a, a sort of a small house, and that was like a clinic or a little hospital, you might say. And he found an old man who had fell down in the gutter, and he literally picked him up on his shoulder and brought him into, the, uh, 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 into his little house. And that was the beginning of Alexian Brothers in the United States. 
three years later, he always thought of St. Louis because it reminded him so much. The Mississippi reminded him of the Rhine. So he came to St. Louis in 1869, and he, uh, there was a Simon's Mansion that was there, which is right here on this ground. It was the Simon Mansion. Mr. Simon uh, was a banker, and he also, uh, what he did was he gave a big donation to Brother uh, Bonaventure, saying, I'm glad you bought this house, and you're going to use it for a good purpose. And on April uh, 19th, 1869, his, or 18, I think it was 1870, because he had to get it all organized. His first, uh, his, his first uh, patient was, uh, happened to be a priest, uh, so that he took care of that, and then it began to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And, uh, so, and also, it's interesting because this is the 70th anniversary of the exorcism. When did it take place? 1949, 2019. 70 years ago, the exorcism took place at our hospital. Not this building, but the old Alexian Brothers Hospital, which is now demolished. And I'll tell you some stories about that. And there's a, someone here in the audience who's going to tell you the story as well because of the uh, room in which the exorcism took place in the hospital. Okay, first of all, let me just say this. Um, I... Uh, one of our brothers, uh, Brother John Grider, some of you may know him, uh, he uh, was here in St. Louis and uh, we, he got sick. He was the last brother that literally took care of Robbie. We call him Robbie. We promised that we would never give his real name. He was not from St. Louis. He was from Mount Rainier, Maryland. That's where he originally was from. And let me get, uh, but anyway, we pro on his deathbed, uh, about four or five years ago, I promised that we would do a documentary or something on him in which we would emphasize what the brothers did because the brothers didn't always get the credit. It seemed like the priests always got the credit, but not the brothers. You know. So anyway, I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, all that the brothers did very shortly. Uh, I use the name Robbie because that's the name that we, we use, and, uh, and uh, then I'm going to tell you another thing that happened to me. This was uh, when Robbie, when they asked, when uh, Father Bodern asked to have Robbie placed in the hospital. Well, here's the story. Robbie was about 14 years old. His, uh, uh, I think it was his aunt, was very much into the Ouija boards and, and uh, spirit spiritualism, and then she had died. And anyway, all kinds of things were happening in the house where he was staying and where the house where his parents were. There was a nice picture of Jesus, you know, knocking on the door. And all of a sudden, sometimes you could see that it was flipping. Then all of a sudden, there were, seemed to be all kinds of cockroaches and crickets all over the place and hearing him. And they were saying, where is this coming from? This was never here before. Strange sounds. And uh, he began to act pretty strange himself. And by the way, the boy was, uh, the parents were not Catholic, so they knew nothing about, uh, except that there were strange things happening. The mattress sometimes would start levitating. And so what they did, they went to their own minister of their church. And the minister, uh, sort of what he did was he said, let me, let me see him. She said, his mother said, it only happens, it seems like in the evening. During the day, he's not so bad, but in the evening, he gets real strange, goes into these sort of convulsions and all kinds of stuff. And uh, boy, is he a good spitter. He can spit you right in the face. <laughs> he's a good aimer. Boom. And uh, the boy didn't know any uh, Latin or anything, and he would speak even a few Latin words. So what happened was uh, the, um, the, the minister said, oh, let me just go to, I'll go to your house, and I will stay with him uh, one evening and just observe him. So he was sitting in his chair, the, uh, the minister was, and all of a sudden, uh, Robbie would start, it was especially around 10, 10.30 at night, to, to have these strange events. The, 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 uh, the, uh, he would be saying these words, and he would be spitting, and he would be you know, real mean and cruel, and things would be sh shifting in the house like, and these strange noises. And uh, the minister said, oh, mm -hmm. Something is not right here. He said, he said, nothing is right. 
He said, you know what, let me tell you something. This was before the ecumenical movement, you know, way back in 49. He said, those Catholics, they have these ancient prayers of exorcism. They are prayers that are 600 years old. And he said, I, what I would do is go to the neighborhood Catholic church and see someone over there. Maybe they can work this out. And so they did. And the uh, priest said, well, okay, let me, he did the same thing with the minister. Let me just watch the kid uh, and see how, how he does and let me, let me see. And I, I'll have, uh, I'll say some prayers or whatever. And the same thing happened. But what happened too was the boy somehow got a hold of the spring under the mattress and he slashed the priest's arm, 22 stitches all around. And he said, oh, that's enough for me. That's enough for me, that's, that's it. Meanwhile, the parents, uh, one day, a few days later, uh, they heard Robbie was in the bathroom. He was in the, you know, looking at himself in the mirror. And all of a sudden, they heard him, oh, oh, they heard him screaming. And she ran into the bathroom. He had somehow, like someone was scratching in his flesh on his chest. Louis, L-O-U-I-S, St. Louis. And they said, we have relatives in St. Louis. I, that must be a sign that we should go there. And so they brought him to St. Louis in Belle Nor, which is the northern uh, suburb of, of, in St. Louis. And they stayed there for a, one of the members of the family was a student at St. Louis University. And so what she did was she said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to ask uh, the, the priest, the, the pastor there, about this whole situation. His name was Father Boulder. And so he, they got a picture of, I mean, they, uh, uh, she talked to him. And he said, well, let me, uh, let me, I'll bring him over to the rectory and we'll see what happens. And the same thing began to happen. And it was, and then they went back to, uh, they, he stayed there for some days at the rectory because they had extra rooms there. And then what happened was they went back home to Belnor, and then back and forth. And finally, Father uh, Bodern said, that, that's it. We have to do something now. We got to give this boy proper care, continuity of care, and uh, he needs to be in a hospital in a psychiatric ward. I don't know any person who will take him any, any hospital except the Alexian brothers. I know them, they're not that far away, and they will take him. And sure enough, he called Brother Cornelius, who by the way was the, uh, Brother Cornelius was the uh, uh, administrator of the hospital here. And uh, Brother Cornelius uh, said, absolutely, bring him over, and we will give him 24-hour care, and the brothers did their around the clock they would do his, they cleaned up after him. And they saw, by the way, the brothers, every brother will tell you this, they saw strange things every day. The boy would spit in their face. The boy would curse at them. And during, during the day, he was fine. Brother, and he became a real good friend of, of, of one of the brothers, uh, Brother Emmett. And Brother Emmett would take him sometimes out of the hospital room into the backyard because we had a lot of flowers and stuff. Even though it was April, there was, you know, the blooming, uh, the flowers were blooming. And the boy just said, oh, brother, you are so good to me. And the parents were just so happy about this whole thing. So uh, what we're going to do now is I'm going to read you a letter. Uh, this is from uh, to Brother Cornelius <clears throat> from St. Louis, from uh, one of the priests who was helping with the exorcism. Father Bodur was the chief exorcist, but he also had other priests. And one of them, by the way, was the documentarian. What he did was he, day each day, he would write up the history of what happened that day, every single day. As you can see, they crossed out the name of the boy because we, didn't, we felt very much obligated not to, uh, not to expose his name. That's why we call him Robbie, even though that's not his name whatsoever, but we called him Robbie on this. But um, let, me, let me just, uh, this, this is the letter that we received after the exorcism, the prayers took effect. The enclosed report is a summary this, of the case which you have known for the past several weeks. The brother's part in this case has been so very important that I thought you should have the case history for your per permanent file. 
One of the finest benefits that has come to me as a result of this case is a high appreciation of the work and religious devotion of the Alexian brothers. The prayerful assistance of your community was certainly a strong factor in winning the battle against Satan. Your own cooperation to the extent of establishing public devotion to Our Lady of Fatima will always be associated with the inspirational aspects of this case. The family has been won over completely by the wholehearted charity of your brothers. There is little doubt that the intention of Mrs., which is the boy's mother, to become Catholic has been deeply influenced by the Christ-like attitude of the brothers who worked with her. And uh, so what happened was, let me, let me just explain a little bit here. Brother uh, Cornelius uh, was, uh, the reason why I got a hold of this, Brother Cornelius was the uh, head of uh, the young brothers who were all on uh, different, uh, they were getting their education in different fields of health care. And there was uh, 33 of them. And then he had gotten sick. It was, this was in Chicago. And I happened to be there in Chicago as a young brother. And they asked me to take his place. Shortly after he left, he passed away. So one evening, or one day, it took me about a year before I, I, because I, I, I had his desk, I had all of his, uh, uh, you know, his uh, office and stuff. I opened up the bottom drawer. I said, I need to clean this drawer out. I haven't cleaned it at all. And I, lo and behold, I felt some paper. It was this. I said, oh my gosh, look at that. So, that, that, so I, uh, I kept it because I thought I would be, someday I might be talking about this. So, <laughs> so then, um, here's what, but here's what happened in terms of Brother Cornelius. Uh, during the 1940s, of those of you who are Catholic, you might remember I, as a little kid, I was 11 years old, when, I, when the exorcism took place, I was 11 years old in, in Wisconsin, but I do remember very much the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. I remember as a little boy singing, Dear Lady of Fatima, each time that you appear to help your intercession for peace and unity. Anyway, there was great devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. And so what, did, what Brother Cornelius did was he bought that statue here in St. Louis he put it in the lobby of the hospital, and uh, in order to, because the brothers prayed the rosary around the clock. They gave him physical care, yes, but they also gave him spiritual care. They prayed the rosary around the clock, and believe me, they saw all kinds of things happening. You would, uh, oh, they, 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 they could tell you stories. None of them are living anymore, but they could tell you stories of what they saw in terms of bringing in a bringing in a tray of food, all of a sudden the plate would go like that and fall on the floor, or that he would take that plate and he'd shove it into the brother's, try to shove it in the brother's face. He would try to escape, and this would happen usually at night. And so they would uh, you know, try to calm him down, even though he loved the brothers, but at night there seemed to be a change of personality, especially at night when it was dark. And uh, so anyway, um, finally, uh, so, Brother bought uh, that statue. Then in April, toward the end of April of 1949, is the Easter season is coming up, and there's the what we call the Triduum, or Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter Sunday. Father Bodern said, and um, by, by the way, before I get into that, uh, would you show um, the, uh, the St. Michael the Archangel? That is a statue of St. Michael the Archangel that Brother Cornelius brought to the boy's room on his bedside stand. Uh, it was about uh, pretty much uh, a few weeks after he got there. Brother put that in his room because Michael stands for St. Michael and it, it, it's the, the, putting a spear in the, in the devil. Uh, and that's what St. Michael is noted for. <clears throat> so he had that. And then during the uh, Holy Week, Brother Cornelius brought that statue from the uh, entrance to the hospital on the first floor to the fifth floor in the corner right next to his room so that Mary, Our Lady of Fatima, was right near there. And, uh, and so the brothers again did the, 
rosary and did a lot of prayers to Our Lady of Fatima. Then I would like to do is now, uh, because Holy Thursday, nothing happened. Holy Saturday or Good Friday, nothing happened out of the ordinary. Uh, the, by, the boy, the, by the way, the boy and the mother and father wanted to become Catholic, so they received communion and everything. And then uh, the boy, uh, it was Easter Sunday. Ah, that's the day that everybody, that's, Father Bodern said, that's the day, I bet you, that's the day when things are going to change. He'll get out of this. The evil will, will uh, evict itself from him. Nothing happened. But then comes the Monday after Easter. And let me read to you what happened, because this is scary in a way, because, you know, this is coming out of the boy's mouth, a real deep-throated uh, voice. The following is an accurate quotation. At 10.45 p.m., this is the Easter Monday, the most striking event of the evening occurred. Robbie was in a seizure, but he was calm in a way. In clear, commanding tones and with dignity, a voice broke into the prayers. The following is an accurate quotation because the priest that was there was taking notes and this is exactly what he wrote. Satan, this is coming out of the boy's mouth. Satan, Satan, I am Saint Michael. And I command you, Satan, and the other evil spirits to leave this body in the name of Dominus. <coughs> Dominus is Latin for God. <coughs> leave now, immediately. Now, now, <coughs> now! Then there was the most violent contortions of the entire period of exorcism. That is, since March 16th. Perhaps this was the fight to the finish. Father O'Flaherty and the brothers and Father Bodron were weary and sore physically from the exertion, but they said, oh my God, he's gone. Immediately, Robbie came back to normal and said, huh, I feel good, he's gone. He doesn't remember a thing, he doesn't remember one thing. All he re remembers is that he was feeling so good. And what it's saying is something that, uh, uh, you know, uh, whether you believe in evil spirits or not, that's not the point. The point is that we know that evil exists. And what the brothers did, dedicated entire evenings and days and taking care of this boy and being spit at and all kinds of stuff, that evil was conquered by good the brother's goodness to this boy, which the parents couldn't get over how great the brothers were to their, to their boy. And, uh, and so he left. After that, he, he left, went back to Mount Rainer, which we believe he still, he married in 19, uh, let me see, 1970. Robbie married in 1970. And he doesn't remember anything that happened, but he does remember the brothers were so good to him, and he appreciates that very, very much. Whether he's still living, I'm not sure. I, some say that he is still living. He's not in Mount Rainer, but in an area near Mount Rainer in uh, eastern part of Maryland. Okay, um, what I'm going to do now is just see if uh, you have any, uh, any questions at all for me. Yes. I've heard, uh, I don't know if it's true or not, but I just, I've heard that the house in Belnor is haunted. Is that true? Uh, some say that the house in Belnor is haunted. There are some who do say that. I, I, I don't know. I was never, I was never there. I never went there. Yes. Um, I'm actually going to be the listing agent for that house. Oh. <laughs> oh, my God. 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 Oh, my Okay. I was raised Catholic. Yeah. The St. Vincent Fields High School. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. My school sister in Notre Dame told us uh -huh. that there was a boy that went to a Lutheran uh, grade school on Shenandoah Avenue. Uh -huh. And that, is, and that um, um, <clears throat> it was a rainy day, so they had brought the raincoats. Yeah. And 
they went row by row and told the kids to uh, get their to get their raincoats. And now this is the school sister, Norma yeah. Bain, Sister Mary Matthews, so I'm pretty sure it was her. And she said when it came to his turn, he floated to the ceiling and went back and got it. Now, I want to know if that's part of the story or something that she said. Also, Father Kester, who was the pastor of St. Francis Hills in the 60s, said that there was dress desecrations done to the uh, statue of Mother Mary in the, in the inside the sanctuary. Yeah, so I want to know if any of that was done by this young man. I don't, uh, I, I don't think, no, I don't think it was at all, because he went pretty much immediately back to, uh, uh, to Mount Rainer. Yeah, so he, no, he, I don't think that has anything to do with this, this case. Okay, anybody else? So, how uh, the hospital room where the exorcist took place? Is it, yeah. Was it permanently haunted? Or? Okay, very good question. And I'm going to ask uh, Pat Lampy to come up here, Pat. Uh, I want to say to you that what we did, once the boy left, the room was never used for a patient again. It was never used for a patient. It was used as a storage room. That's what we used it for. Pat was working here at that time, so let him give you a little uh, from, from his own experience. Thank you, Brother Warren. Um, I worked in purchasing part-time in the early 70s uh, while I was putting myself through college. And we used the uh, old psychiatric unit up on the fifth floor as a storage area for our main storeroom. Uh, and the room in which the exorcism took place is where we stored our toilet tissue and our paper towels. Um, and this was kind of an abandoned area of the hospital. Uh, these rooms were designed for psychiatric use. Uh, each of the rooms were fairly small and had a very thick oak door closing each room. The doors had a, a small peephole in each door, and there was no hardware on the inside of the door, and the doors were designed to be self-closing. And we always got a lot of questions about whether these rooms were haunted or not. Um, but we, I've never had anything happen in these rooms. However, one time I did go into this room with the toilet tissue and paper towels. We always had to be careful to prop the door open since they were self-closing. Once I went in and thought I propped the door open, and uh, moments later the door closed on me, and I was stuck in that room for probably 45 minutes before someone realized I was missing and came to get me. As you know, early in the 90s, uh, we didn't have cell phones, so there was no way for me to contact anyone. But uh, the rooms really were not haunted in any way, as far as I know. Um, but that is a question we get quite frequently. Thank you very much, Pat. Uh, any other questions that you might have over here? Let's see. Yes. Um, Two-part question. Is there a musical component to the exorcism prayers? And is there any further public information available on Robbie's aunt's activities in Maryland? Uh, no, there isn't for either of you. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering when the old hospital was demolished. Yeah, when when was it? Um, it was demolished in Brother Tom, why don't you come up here for a minute and tell them about what you saw. Well, I can just uh, go from here. Uh, 1980 was demolished, but Brother Tom was went to see, right before the wrecking ball came uh, the evening before, he went to that area and this is what he found. I don't have a great uh, recollection on that, but you know, the room was there and it was kind of a normal room. I didn't see anything really unusual there, but uh, did you say there was a seance, you thought there was a... Yeah, at times there was some unusual things like that, but I don't have a strong recollection on that anymore either. Well, I have a personal connection, if, if yeah. I could tell. In uh, 1968, a good friend of mine and I were busing tables down at the Cheriton restaurant. Oh, yeah. Right down the street, Joe Tangero, an old restaurant. And he started bending over and apparently was having an appendicitis. 
So after he couldn't straighten up anymore, Joe let us leave, and I brought him to the Lection Brothers, mm -hmm. the old yeah. section. Oh, yeah. Okay. They operated. He was fine. He had to stay in the hospital about a week. Uh -huh. And every day I visited him, the nuns kept coming in and telling us, you haven't gone up to the fifth floor, have you? <laughs> <laughs> and we just looked at each other and went, why does, yeah. why does she keep saying that? <laughs> we were in the seminary at the time, both yeah. of us. Oh, yeah. St. Yeah. Louis Prep Seminary yeah. on Shrewsbury. And um, anyway, he was getting uh, released. Uh -huh. So the last day I came up and visited him, we went up to the fifth floor. <laughs> <laughs> so we were walking down the hall, it was uh -huh. July. It was 95 degrees outside. Oh, yeah. oh. We got up to the landing and started walking down the hall. As we walked down the hall, it got colder, oh, colder, yeah. colder, and colder, yeah. and you could see your breath like it was winter. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And by the time we got to the middle room, every door was sealed. Uh -huh. We just had this feeling of terror, and we just turned and ran. Uh -huh. <laughs> no doubt yeah. in my mind, he that, was this. That, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, those those things, uh, those are what others have experienced, uh, a real coldness as they approach the room. Yeah. Yes? I, I, I was just wondering, I've been raised um, that over at, Saint, and it might be a rumor that over at St. Xavier Church, uh -huh, yeah. that they witnessed uh, Michael beating the devil down around the same time? Uh, yes, yes, that is correct. That, <laughs> The uh, priests were at the, uh, they, some of them were up that evening, and that, that Monday after Easter, when all this occurred, and they saw a bright light in the sanctuary of the church, of St. Francis Xavier Church, in which they saw something that looked like St. Michael the Archangel. Yeah, and there, it was real bright, and then, and then they heard this loud bang. Yeah, you're right. That's what, uh, yeah. yeah. I didn't know if it was rumors or No, not. I think uh, that's what they said. That's what they said. Yeah. I don't, it's not in the, it's not in the uh, documentary, but that, that, uh, that is what I had heard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anybody else? Excuse me. Huh? I just want oh. to share something. Um, I actually did work here, so I wanted okay. to share that. I worked here um, as a ward clerk, and I worked in uh, medical records here back in the day, and that was in the seven, uh, let's see, 1977 through about 81. And it was in the old building, and then I also worked in the new building. And that room was definitely there. It was definitely roped off. And my training as a ward clerk was up in those areas. And you could walk past there, and then obviously they take you back down, but I did get trained up around there. And I think of all the brothers that, you know, all of that was hush hush. You didn't speak of it, and you just kind of went on your day. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, well, we'll go right here, and then we'll. How many exorcisms did it take? Well, it took. Uh, it took. Uh, oh, it must have been about. Oh, I would say, thirty to to, to forty uh, exorcisms. Uh, actually, praying over the boy he, almost every night since he. Uh, before he even entered the hospital, and after he entered the hospital, the same thing. Yeah, almost every day he was, these prayers were said over him. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, yes? Uh, when all this was going on, did Robbie, did he remember anything during the day of what was going on at night? Uh, no, he didn't remember very much at all during the day. No, he was, he was pretty fine. Just a few, maybe minor things, but nothing of significance at all, no, from what we gathered. He, he, he didn't remember anything during the day. It was only at night when these, those things happened. And he did not remember the night. He did not remember that he was even spitting at people or anything like that. He didn't remember that at all. was closed after that event? Not just that. Um, uh, Pat, was the uh, whole floor closed or whoever? Roped, it was roped off. They had those little roped off ones where there's little, little ropes and they're like the little metal things that they attach to. That's yeah. That's what they had around that room. Okay. So the room, what about the rest of it? Uh, for the only area that I've seen was Just uh, that certain area next to where we got Where he was, yeah. It's been so long. Is that right, Pat? Um, when I was up there, it was not really roped off. Oh, uh -huh. The education department had one way. I think the education department had one wing, 
and then when they had opened it up for storage for us, we had access to the rest of it. So the ropes had been removed by then. Oh, by then. Okay. Okay, there are some questions over here. <coughs> or on this side. <coughs> okay. I'm just wondering if anything has happened at this hospital, the new hospital, since the old one was tore down and this one was reopened. Hear a lot of rumors, so that's not true. No, 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 it's not true at all. In fact, uh, ev yeah, uh, yeah. every single Halloween, someone comes to the front desk and says, is this where the exorcism happened? And I have a friend who, uh, uh, he said to me, he said, you know, Brother Warren, I live right near the hospital. And when I was a kid, we all would uh, we'd look over and we'd imagine that we saw a green slime coming from the fifth floor. <laughs> there was no green slime coming from the fifth floor. Will there ever be an opportunity for anybody to read what's on those papers? Um, those, well, those are, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. <laughs> Unless there's a, a copy machine nearby where you can copy this and then it would make. Yeah. <laughs> okay, all right, all right. Well, I'll tell you what, let me, we're going to continue now. Yes, one more question and then we'll go on to part two. Do any psychological or clinical notes survive for the case? Um, actually, I don't know whether there was any, um, uh, all I know is that a, uh, the boy was seen in Mount Rainer by a psychologist and I don't know of any notes that were uh, that were about that. But she felt that he was, uh, you know, fairly normal, apparently, from what I gather. Yeah. Okay, uh, Pat Rick is a, uh, he'll tell you his story, and uh, I'll hand over the mic to him. Well, he's got his own mic. Thank you for coming this evening. Um, I've written a couple of books, and one of those books is about the Alexian Brothers Monastery up in Wisconsin. Uh, and when I wrote, wrote that particular book, I mentioned the exorcism, and I only dedicated a couple of pages uh, within that book. And I'm really glad that I did because I, um, I've learned so much more since that book. And I'm in the process of writing a book. And the book is entitled, A Purloined Diary, An Unsettling Case Study of an Exorcism. This is a working title. It might change a little bit. But I'm here this evening to give you a peek into what I've written, what I've discovered, and I suspect I'm going to discover a little bit more. So, from the preface of that book, this is what I've written. And I won't read you the entire preface, but I'm going to give you a peek into what I've been writing. The author William Peter Blatty wrote The Exorcist in 1971. The movie followed in 1973, both on paper and especially the film, directed by William Friedman, Friedkin, I'm sorry, uh, startled, scaring the hell out of millions. I sat in a Dallas theater with shivers going up my spine for different reasons than the other movie patrons. I was privy to the truth and background that gave birth to this fictional story of a young girl demonically, uh, demonically possessed. In my book, I'm offering you a different perspective. I shall neither try to dissuade, debunk, recruit, or convince believers or disbelievers, nor will I attempt to tell you uh, an idea about exorcism and the practice of the rite by the Roman Catholic Church. 
But first, allow me to take you back in time. There were cars meeting them at the train station. There were more than a dozen young men having traveled together from Chicago that July morning, 1966. Their train passed through Milwaukee, skirted Green Bay, and ultimately disembarked at Shawano, Wisconsin. In less than an hour, they would arrive home, their new home, that is, Gresham, Wisconsin, a bucolic little village. Meeting them were three men in black, a Norbertine priest and two Alexian brothers, dressed in clerical business suits and white clerical Roman collars, looking as if made, as if made for Hollywood. Their journey delivered them to a monastery and a storybook appearing institution. Beside a waterfall on the edge of a lovely wooded area, their destination was just a healthy walk, this walking distance from that nearby village. Breathtaking would not be an exaggerating uh, adjective for, to describe their arrival. Greeting them were more men in black, wearing monastic garb as if they were also straight out of central casting. Enthusiastic young men more than their, more, more their age poured out of the grand entrance overlooking the water, introducing themselves as brother this and brother that. They brought the new arrivals luggage in from the caravan of cars. Now, the fresh recruits stood inside what was once a grand mansion given to the Alexian brothers by a lonely, wealthy woman. It was as if a movie crew selected this location to create a film. Authentic costumes, the sterile feeling of a cloistered co uh, convent, and the realization they had committed to join the Alexians. The new men would learn the Alexians traced their origins to the early 12th century. So before I go any further, it's only fair I tell you I was among one of those new arrivals in 1966. It was at this place and how I came to learn a closely kept secret. After six months, our postulate class had dwindled down to only eight. Over the centuries, the Alexian brothers learned how to weed out, in, uh, out individuals not fitting or those wishing to leave on their own volition. Not long after, I became an Alexian novice and given the religious name of Gordon. We were sat down and told the basics of an astonishing story dating back to 1949. Brother Florian Eberle, our novice master, took it upon himself to divulge a bundle of unbelievable facts. Florian was not just telling us a story handed down to him. He saw, heard, and experienced firsthand an exorcism. When writing an earlier book, The Abbey and Me, only two pages did I dedicate. But I'm glad I did. As I said earlier, I'm glad I waited. In this book, A Purloined Diary, you will read the details, recently discovered documents, and recorded <coughs> interviews with individuals playing integral roles add to this account. This is a true story. It's reared its head demanding attention. The story won't go away after spanning many decades. So sit back, read, or listen this true account. Further into the book, which is partially written at this point, here's an excerpt from the chapter. Before days dawn on October 1st, 2018, I drove away from Austin, Texas. My car was loaded with an inventory of my new books, expunged, published earlier this year, or that year rather. I also brought along a supply of my first book, The Abbey and Me, written seven years earlier. I was on several missions the last weeks, perhaps a month, packing new, a few changes of clothes I considered the fall weather could bring cool surprises. So 
dressing with layers, or our dressing uh, uh, in layers, would have to work for me other than bulky outerwear. I planned a long aggressive drive to St. Louis from Austin for that day. It was somewhere in East Oklahoma uh, and finding and fiddling with the GPS that I remind myself I was only halfway to St. Louis that day. $2.50 and the Will Rogers Turnpike in Oklahoma delivered me to the Missouri state line near Joplin. I felt the need for another power nap. Instead, I pushed on. Ash Grove, Missouri, a gas tank uh, running low, sleeplessness, and I-45 overtook me. It wasn't until 7 p.m. that evening that I pulled into the residence of the Alexian Brothers in St. Louis, nearly 15 hours of drive time that was over. Greeted by five Alexians, Alexians, there was plenty of gray hair to go around, including my own. I was shown to my guest quarters, 3910 Ohio Street, Avenue rather, at the intersection of Keokuk Street. It is important I more uh, uh, precisely describe the location of this residence. The Alexian brothers are positioned in the extreme northeast or northwest corner of a large city block occupied today by St. Alexis Hospital. Broadway and bordered to the south by Osage Street. I lay in my bed thinking that when I was only one year old, something extraordinary had taken place here in 1949, involving Jesuit priests, Alexian brothers, and a 14-year-old boy. Too tired to sleep, I tinkered with the bedside clock radio until I stumbled on George Nuri in his late night talk show, Coast to Coast AM. I recall being a guest on his show years earlier when my book, The Abbey and Me, was published. So it's the next day. The auxiliary bishop was taken on a brief tour of the newer hospital built in 1970. He acknowledged the statue of the Virgin Mary and the devotion to Our Lady of Fatima. The significance here was the role this five-foot statue played and represented during the 1949 exorcism that took place in the old hospital. That is the old hospital built in the 1870s. And once stood in the same location, the entourage of visiting bishop stepped outside of the front door of the hospital only to be confronted by Christ the Healer, this 16-foot tall brass and fiberglass, fiberglass uh, sculpture, was dedicated in 1984 part of the Alexian's 650th anniversary. The Brothers Kitchen prepared a simple business lunch to chat with Bishop Ribatuso. During a lull and bites of sandwich, I leaned over and introduced myself. I explained I was a former Alexian novice there to learn more about the 1940 exorcism that took place. On this property, I'm, 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 pardon me. He quickly suggested I make an appointment to speak with and visit with the Most Reverend Robert J. Herman, Auxiliary Bishop Emeritus. With the, or, oh, with the Archdiocese of St. Louis, like a hot potato, had I been handed off to someone who was uh, so appropriate, uh, I, I wondered if that was the right person. Tell him I told you to call, Ribatuso said. Perhaps I'd been handed a gift. I considered emeritus. Hmm. Meant someone had been around for a bit longer than the rest of us, and I knew a few things of historic value. Hopefully, but would it also indicate Herman was among those preferring to keep the rite of exorcism close to his chest and unwilling to discuss 1949? Auxiliary Bishop Robert Herman came from a generation of St. Louis Catholic uh, priests that were tight-lipped 
because they had been instructed to be that way. I'd acquired an original signed letter that had been strictly forbidden by then Archbishop of St. Louis, later Cardinal Archbishop Ritter, to diverge any information about the case. That quote came from a letter written May 4th, 1972. William S. Bowden, the Jesuit, point man and exorcist in 1949. In part, this is why I wish to get the, to the bottom of this story from the perspective of the Alexian brothers who assisted the Jesuits in 1949. I did not expect to get full disclosure from everyone, but I was going to give it a try. After three St. Louis days and three nights in search of facts, half-truths, and secrets hidden away, my bags were packed to drive less than five hours to Chicago. I drove past the old brewery, the Gateway Arch, and crossed the Mississippi into the land of Lincoln. My next destination was the home of an old friend, Ray. Ray was not just a friend, he was an acquaintance having experienced time as an Alexian and considered him a good resource for this story. Ray was to be one of my hosts while I was in this circular route through the country. I was particularly interested in Ray, uh, his Alexian days. Ray was trained by one of the senior Alexian brothers known as Brother Jadokas. Jadokas was an interesting character. The two Alexian brothers were not fond of each other. Their chemistry clashed. Before he died, an old man, Jadokas appeared on my radar. Rumor had it he knew more than a little something about exorcism in 1949. St. Louis ex exorcism, that is. So I was off to Wisconsin, following Chicago. I owed my host more insight into the reason for coming back to Wisconsin and its north woods. I knew they knew hadn't driven, I hadn't driven 1,400 miles just to sell a few books and visit a destroyed landmark I already knew extremely well. Approaching 15 years in sickness and health, I had developed a relationship with my host. This husband and wife team, we clicked. They are just that way. Lubricated with a glass of wine, I was at ease describing my latest adventure, and they coaxed me to talk. And uh, who is this person you're going to up north to see, they asked. I began to tell them this new developing story. About two years early, I received one of those mysterious emails from a stranger. Occasionally, people will go to the trouble to track you down, find, write, hope they hear back from you. This email was one of those out of the blue occurrences. I couldn't ignore this particular email from the reader. Uh, I couldn't ignore it, I meant to say. The Abbey and me. Renegades, rednecks, real estate and religion. I was, I was intrigued. In his correspondence, Don told me he was trained as a nurse by the Alexian brothers in Chicago and St. Louis. Something told me the stranger might have more interesting things to share. If I were to ever wish to publish another edition under the same title, I wrote back to Don, resulting in a phone conversation later. In that telephone call, the subject matter drifted toward 1949 exorcism, having taken place under the watchful eye of the Alexians in their St. Louis hospital. Don told me it was in the mid-1950s when he came into the picture. Don volunteered to me that he had information directly connected with a certain secret saga occurring within view of the Mississippi River. More specifically, it was at 3933 South Broadway in that famous town known as River City. I suspect that I knew what he meant. 
Little did I know, he had much more I suspected. Don was quite frank, confessing he purloined something long sought after by storytellers, filmmakers, authors for years. Almost immediately, he asked me if I wanted to have a copy. Well, if yes, I thought. <laughs> But I hesitated, and not sure why I was reluctant to jump at the opportunity placing, uh, placed in front of me. I didn't want enthusiasm to get ahead of me. We spoke again by phone. Don made the same offer once again. This time I suggested he keep the original, send me a, and send me a photocopy. Soon I received a package containing a duplicate of the copied diary of the 1949 exorcism, composed and typed by one of the exorcists. The package included supporting documents I had, uh, I had not uh, anticipated. The evening with my inquisitive Wisconsin friends encouraged me to have another glass of wine with them, and I did. My hosts expressed concern when I explained my destination the next morning. I had a rendezvous scheduled with the mysterious Don. I was a little uneasy as well, but determined to meet and interview this puzzling person. So finally I had an opportunity to sit down and talk to this man face to face. With everything in front of me, I began. Why did you take that document on the exorcism from the hospital? I abruptly quizzed Don. I'd already looked into the, his background and knew he entered the Alexian Brothers School of Nursing in Chicago. Unabashed and 60 years later, retired nurse, Don and I continued our interview. He walked over to his filing cabinet and extracted a large, aged, fragile, legal-sized envelope. Its contents were the original 1958 typed copy, not one of the carbon papers uh, of the case study diary. Don said one of his <coughs> co-conspirators uh, co uh, co we flipped a coin to see which would keep the original. Well, Don did. Before I started this road trip adventure, I told trusted people about my coincidence, my correspondence rather, with Don. Uh, his acquisition of the diary is generally viewed as unprofessional behavior for a trusted medical professional. I had to ask myself, what would I do if given the same opportunity? So I came back through Chicago, Milwaukee, and then to St. Louis. It was awkward at times because I was chasing dead people in connection with the 1949 exorcism, and the deceased involved in the book and film that followed. I felt as if a clock was ticking over the heads of living people possessing credible information. Those people were dwindling. Reliable uh, sources were hard to find or had lost interest. Worse yet, their memory. It was this Alexian backstory I was exploring, not the typical Jesuit exorcist drama that had been beat to death for over 70 years. I stumbled upon the Feasting Fox, originally established by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated in the Dutch town neighborhood near the hospital. The dining and drinking establishment built in 1913 was a prohibition family, friend, Bavarian style effort, <coughs> combining a wholesome atmosphere to eat and imbibe. 
The evening dinner crowd had not arrived yet, so I took a seat at the bar, ordered beer and a German-style pork entree. Since there were only a few customers, the bartender and I had time to visit. She asked me those routine who, what, where, when questions. Eventually got around to my purpose for visiting the city, the neighborhood exorcism. Eventually, we got around to my purpose for visiting the city, like I said, the exorcism. Others seated at the bar joined in with their knowledge of 1949 story. I could only imagine 70 years ago, hushed conversations about the same subject took place at this neighborhood watering hole. Like old people recalling the sinking of the Titanic, or my generation remembering where they were and what they were doing when President Kennedy was assassinated, my evening at the Feasting Fox reinforced the story was still alive but fading. I felt it my duty to breathe fresh air into the St. Louis exorcism for a generation who were young when the World Trade Center towers fell in New York. This visit to St. Louis was approaching an end, but I knew I'd be back. And I'm back. <laughs> and I'm writing the book. And I hope it to be ready near the end of the year or sometime in the fall. So I don't have a scary story to tell you, but I want to provide you with good, accurate information where there is some data that will give you information about what took place in this very location those many years ago. What kind of questions can I answer for you tonight? Yes, ma'am. That's I see one of those appears to be colored red. Ah. <coughs> Here's a learning experience for me. So I asked, I think Pat, Pat Lamping, I think I asked questions. Well, I didn't quite understand. But it seems to me that I am finding out, and correct me if I'm wrong, Pat, uh, I was told that there was an elevator, I believe, over here, yes? Yes, yeah, train elevator. And that when you exited that elevator, you would walk to the south. And it was my understanding that there was a door down, and to the left is where the room was. I hear differently from other people. But this is not unusual for us to hear different versions. People not knowing which is east and which is west, or which is north, or which is south. Because there are some people that are, are completely unaware that the sun sets in the west. <laughs> So, Pat, what do you say? Uh, yes, you're, you're correct. You would find the door to your left as you exited that freight elevator. Okay. About three or four rooms down. Just today alone, I've heard different versions. It's clearly to the right. It's clearly to the left. So, I guess for detail, people like that. But an exorcism did take place up there on that floor, somewhere in one of those rooms. Another question? Um, has this exorcism ever been, ever been acknowledged by the Vatican? I'm under, I'm under the impression that it hasn't been acknowledged as an actual exorcism by the Vatican. Is that still correct? Um, well, um, because there are so many Jesuits involved, uh, I don't think that uh, uh, the Vatican, the Vatican sort of, in a sense, I would say, take, took for granted that this was a real exorcism because of the fact that the Jesuits were involved in this and a number of Jesuits were involved with it, who did the, actually, the, 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 the day day case study, which just proved because there are some, the fake exorcisms, by the way, there are some. In fact, one of the, uh, someone in the Congo, a cardinal or something, was, uh, uh, the Vatican said, no more, because it was more fake than real. But I think they, they know that this was the real thing. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, because I only asked because I know that their reasoning for not accepting it initially was because he did not show the cardinal knowledge that is required to be identified as like a real possession. Because they have to have like those certain things that happen to check off the box to be like, well, he yeah. has physical thing, yeah. he has the um, affliction of holy materials, and then they were saying that there was the cardinal knowledge. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Well. I don't know, like, do you guys have like no. An example from no. 1949 is a hell of a lot different than 2019. <laughs> the way medicine is practiced today was not the way medicine was practiced. And the church is, was different back then as it is today. Fundamentally, this is my opinion. Uh, anybody would be a fool to, to believe that Somewhere in a filing cabinet in Rome, this exists. And what the opinions are today might have been very different back when Pope Pius XII was around. Yes? There was supposedly an exorcism done in Christ Church Cathedral about this time. Was, it, was this born in Christ and it failed? And that's why they were turned, was turned over to, this Robbie was turned over to the plane. Never heard of such a thing. Never heard of no. Such a thing. Yes. Hi, thanks for doing this. Um, how did the media treat it? Do you have anything from the media or anything? I'm, I'm 66, my mother had a lot of scrapbooks. She uh, lived in North City and I've looked through them to see if I saw any media. And also, why wouldn't people have celebrated this? I mean. Exorcism is recognizing evil, so why We're celebrating tonight. We're celebrating tonight. Right, but I mean, you know, it's a long time now. Well, the, the, uh, the media is interested, and some of the things that were put up on the board uh, uh, were, uh, uh, were from the media. Uh, I have some samples of it uh, where it's, it, was, it was written from a newspaper. Uh, I think a lot of it was St. Louis University's newspaper, but there was a media uh, attached in which uh, there, there was the uh, story of the exorcism and some of the history behind it. So let me, let me make one suggestion very quickly. Um, knock on the doors of St. Louis University because I think they are planning something in the near future. And let them know that you're interested in more information from whomever has this information. But they won't put, I suspect that something's gonna be put together pretty soon to review this whole thing about 1949 all over again. Well, yes. let me get back to that question. Uh, this is from the Southside Journal March the 14th, 1990, and it says, setting the exorcism record straight, SLU, St. Lucia for Jesuit, shed light on the exorcism of 1949. So it has been in the media. Uh, this was the South Side Journal. It used to be, we don't have that South Side Journal anymore. In 2013, they did a fantastic display at the library there, and they probably plan to do that again. There was hands um, popping up right here. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I, about 12, 15 years ago, I read a very substantial coverage of this whole thing in the Post-Dispatch. Oh. They did a special, I'm not going to say a special edition, but it was either two or three parts, and I can't remember if that was all in one paper or if it was a daily, three parts in a daily, but they really went into it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's not unusual. Yeah, I would say it was standing room only at the Pius the Twelfth Library in 2013 in the fall because St. Louis University did quite a expose in front of a crowd. Yes. So I think, and I don't want to speak for you, but I think the question was more specifically why wasn't it entertained in the media back then? We can't answer for them, but I would like to make an offer on that house if you don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I remember that building. I'm not quite as old as Brother Warren, but I'm older than dirt. <laughs> uh, and I've heard, I've heard it said over the years, and I'm going to embarrass my wife and her friends, 
<laughs> but that when the building was destroyed, torn down, the wrecking ball, when it hit the room where the exorcism took place, it bounced off the building the first time and they had to hit it again a second time. Okay. Have no idea if that's true or not or people just carried that forward over the years, but I've heard it, I've heard that said and I've just wondered about it since then. Uh, another case of a hard-headed possessed person. <laughs> and also I, I heard the same thing. I heard a similar story about that wrecking ball having uh, some strange things happen. Uh, there was a report. The ER was in that yeah. There was a report that Monday night after Easter, and some people say they heard a loud explosion or like the uh, report from a gun. And there's other people that said we didn't hear a thing. So there's different stories, as there are as many different people. But as I said before, the uh, father, the Jesuit who was part of the exorcism uh, most of the time was in the cathedral, was in the St. Uh, Xavier College Church when he said that there was a bang and that they saw something like a St. Michael up in the ceiling of the uh, St. Louis College uh, Church. College Church. Yeah. When you speak of an ancient, rich, ancient Catholic ritual, how far back does exorcism rituals Go. I mean, I'm not Catholic, so I know nothing about this except I recognize the statues and so on. Well, well, we know that in the Gospels, Jesus uh, did expel demons, whatever it was, from people, and that I believe the apostles did the same. So, uh, but I know that the exorcism prayers. Uh, are uh, at least 600 years old. So what between that time, I'm not sure what they use, but I'm sure they prayed over people as Jesus did the same thing. Yes? So in the, in the Christian religion, they talk about the fallen angel who turned into the devil. Do they know that this possession was that specific entity or fallen angel or was it just an evil spirit? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. You well, Lucifer, uh, Lucifer, Lucifer was the chief fallen angel, and so you know it was believed to be evil. So he's not a theologian. I'm not a theologian. We're just observers. Yes, ma'am. Is the document that you got John the same? I. I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. Because I haven't, I, yeah, I haven't seen that yet. All I know is this one is the one that Brother Cornelius received from the uh, Father Bishop who was there at the exorcism. And uh, the bishop said to send him a copy of that. Yeah, well, let, well let, let me address that. Yeah. Let me say in defense, this man has kept his promise. And his promise the other elections were, they were not going to disclose the name or even the details of that. The word has gotten out, but the, he still is keeping his secret and doing what his promise. I am not going to share the boy's name unless the boy shows up tomorrow morning and he says, I'm the boy, I'm now 80 plus years old, and I will sign a piece of paper saying that you can reveal my name. And if that were to happen, I would give that a second thought about uh, uh, disclosing his name. But I am going to keep the promise too because it is the right thing to do. Who's heard of the HIPAA laws? <laughs> well, okay, so for some of the very same reasons. Yes, ma'am. So I heard you part question. One, you know, the old hospital is obviously a beautiful building and it sounds like it was still in use. What was the reason that it was demolished? And the second is, it sounds like the, you know, rites of exorcism has been around for hundreds of years. Has there been any kind of, um, kind of, uh, like confirmation or judgment made as to what they think 
makes certain people more susceptible or predisposed to being possessed, or does it seem completely random? I'm not sure about that, to be honest with you. Uh, and uh, in terms of the hospital, uh, the hospital uh, was needed. Uh, we, you just have to keep up the same way as St. Louis University Hospital now, as you see. If you go down Grand Boulevard, it is a um, whoo, that's going to be a new hospital. We just needed a new hospital, which would be more efficient, and that's why we uh, tore the old one down and built a new one, and then we built the Brothers' Residence. Because the Brothers, by the way, lived in the old hospital, parts of the old hospital. Uh, and then after, uh, with Medicare and all the rest of it, we, we couldn't continue doing that. So then we built ourselves a residence right behind the hospital here at St. Alexis. And, uh, and the hospital is uh, you know, relatively new compared to, uh, uh, because you just have to keep up with, with uh, in healthcare. Yes, sir. Uh, I have sort of a two-part question. Uh, the first part has to do with the, uh, I don't want to, well, I'll use the phrase, but I don't mean it as negatively as it sounds. So, conspiracy of silence, if you will. You know, the, the, uh, was, was there anything <coughs> behind the unwillingness of people to talk about this other than just wanting to avoid the, uh, you know, uh, over glamorization of this and to protect the boy's identity? Was there some other concern that they had? A promise, a promise was made okay. to the family. We will not go out and tell the world what happened to you in your, in your hospital room. And the second part of the question is, how then did the novel come about that uh, the story was learned and novelized and it made it to a movie? Um, William Peter Blatty was a Jesuit trained author. And he had heard about this. He had read something in the, one of the Washington area papers. And he thought, what an interesting story. I think I will fictionalize this and write the book. Then Friedkin comes along and they collaborate on the movie. So he had no direct information about it. It was just kind of second yeah. No, he didn't. You're right. Yes, A uh, little takeoff on that. Was it simply a Hollywood exaggeration of the deaths yes. in the movie? Yes, Franken admits that. Yeah. Very much so. Yes. No one actually died in the uh, rituals? Uh, no, no, the priest didn't jump off the window. And, yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then the boy didn't have his head twisted around. Yeah. And that was all Hollywoodized. Do exorcisms still occur? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes, they do. Here and there? Very often? Or? Worldwide. 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 Yes, ma'am. How did the exorcism prayers come about? Where did they begin? Read the Gospel of Mark. 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 You'll get your prayers in there. Well, he said they were 600 years old. 1,000 years old. Well, they were more formalized. Well, the first one was the Jews were casting out demons. The Pharisees and scribes were casting out demons before Jesus came around. But Jesus came and commanded them with authority. And then he gave that authority to the 12 apostles. And he passed that down to the other apostles and disciples. We have a question over here. You were ahead of him. I just wanted to ask, that is the original statue of Our Lady of Fatima. Do you still have the statue of St. Michael? Oh, yes. The statue of St. Michael is in our archives in Chicago. And in fact, uh, so many people uh, began to touch it that they had to take it out of a common room where a lot of the uh, uh, statues and stuff from all our facilities are placed and because they put it in a more isolated place because people are touching it and touching it almost every day to be four or five people coming in and touching it and you know, it's, it's not, the same way you don't touch a painting all the time either if it's a painting. Yeah. Is it as big as the statue here? Oh no, no, no. It's much smaller. Exactly, exactly. A, a 
Yes, sir. <coughs> my, my colleague, Dr. Adams, I have a two part question. But uh, one is that uh, was the child baptized? Yes. Or afterwards? Uh, afterwards. Afterwards, okay. And uh, the other is uh, it seems that the world is not getting any better. <laughs> and um, there seems to be an increase of demonic activity in the United States and the world. Do you see a concomitant increase in manifestations of the power of God, such as exorcism? Well, I certainly think that there's a tremendous amount of uh, evil in this world, that's for sure. I, I see it every day. We read in the papers every day about killings and about mass. Look at that. Did you ever think that uh, 50 years ago that you'd be afraid to send your kids to school because of uh, uh, because of uh, being blown up or guns or whatever it might be? Uh, so I, I think we uh, I think there's a lot of evil out there. Whether it's you know, I just think there's a lot of evil out there, and we have to get into God or, or higher power. Yes. Are the archives from this hospital, are they in Chicago now? From this hospital? Yes. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah. All the, yeah, there's a lot of stuff. The archives? Uh, not that I know, although I'm, I'm bringing the, what I have, I'm bringing to the archives in Chicago. Any information that I have, which would be already have in our archives, but it's better to be doubly sure. Yes? Um, I am just curious. I've done a lot of research on this for this listing that's coming up. And um, I was just wondering, I've read that it's true that there was a cross carved into the kid's chest. There was something else that was similarly true, like the slashing of the wrists or something. Are there any details like that that? people know of? Um, all we know of is, um, uh, no, I, I don't think there's anything particular. Uh, all we know is for sure that there was this carving on the flesh that said uh, Lewis on it, and that there were some skin kinds of things that were so like scratches on his chest. No, there was more than that uh, on his arms or something, I'm not sure. In the back. In the back, yeah. yeah. No, not the carving in the yeah. back. Yeah. Question <laughs> in the back. Did like, did the scratch like stay, like, you know how they said it like, was fluid? Did it like actually like stay on there long or like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, um, uh, it, I don't know the exactly how long it stayed, but it, it seemed to fade away later. But it, it was, a, it would take a day or two for it. It would fade away. But uh, there was like like anything if you had scratches on, eventually it fades away. And no scarring. Uh, no. No. You know, a lot of these a lot of these questions that people have comparing what took place in '49 versus say psychoanalytical things that have happened today. Who believes that when the boy would was admitted, was he taken for an MRI right away? Do you think? Uh, what about diagnostic ultrasound? Did they did they do that? Okay. What about um, what what about some sort of therapy like shock therapy? He, maybe, maybe. Okay. So have things ch changed since then? Evil <laughs> is. Yeah, things have changed a great deal, and we have to remember that, yes, I, I, you know, we're learning more in psychology. So whether it's a double personality, it could be a personality problem without it being a possession. But either way, either way, what I'm saying is, leave, leave, you can leave here with this tonight, that there are, there are people, which is the Alexian brothers, that care enough to take care of the boy, whether it was because he was truly possessed, or whether because he looked like he was possessed, or whether because he had a double personality, which we don't know enough about, and we might know more about it in 20 years. But regardless, we took care of him. Nobody else would do so. We took care of witches. Nobody took care of witches in the 16th century. We did. 
We, we, we did so many things that nobody else would do. We took care of the, they used to call them idiots. They, they were, they were our madmen. They were people with severe psychiatric conditions. No one would do it. We did it because nobody else would do it. When the pestilence came into Europe in 1347 to 1351, no, the people were dying. The priests fled, people fled, the government officials fled. The brothers stayed behind and actually cared for them. Some of them died of the black bubonic plague, but we stayed behind and we did what we had to do. And we became the official city pallbearers. After that, the pallbearer guilds, the guilds for the dead, because nobody else would do it. I'm proud to be an Alexian brother because of that. And I want to continue that legacy of doing things that nobody else will do. Like, for example, walking down Broadway at 6 o'clock in the morning. There's a guy who's got a gun and says, I, he says, I think I've been drinking too much. And I said to him, have you been drinking too much? Yeah, you look like you've been drinking too much. And uh, he was about 20, uh, 30 years old. And he said, yeah, I said, I've been on drugs too, as you can see, I'm not doing too good. And he said, and of course, I've got a gun here. And I said, oh, you've got a gun. So he took out his gun. He said, yeah. He said, I was going to shoot this guy because he said I owed him more money for, my, for the drugs. And I said, I don't have any more money. He said, you. And then he said, so what he did was he wrestled the guy down. I won't tell you the words that he was using. But he wrestled him. He kicked him in uh, private parts to a point where the guy said, oh, stop, stop. And, and uh, so he said, oh. He said, I, so I, I, but I didn't shoot him. I said, I put my arm around the guy. And I said, you know what? Let me tell you something. God loves you. You could have killed that guy. You had a gun too. You could have killed him. He was maimed. He was hurting in, in that area. But what you did is you saved his life. And I put my arm around him and he said, boy, oh boy, you are the best dude I've ever met. <laughs> And he said, I'm going to walk by the way. And he said, you know, I live down there in Osceola, so I'm going to walk down that way. He said, that's fine, you can walk down <laughs> So anyway, I think uh, any other things. We're, what we're going to close now with is, uh, because I just want to say that what we're celebrating is that even though it's a new hospital, Brother Bonaventure Thalen came here in 1869, and the exorcism took place here, all kinds of other things, mental health, all kinds of things. People couldn't pay for it. We said, come on in anyway. And so it's, this is holy ground. And we're going to listen. Barbara Spryzen wanted to come, but her flight was delayed, so she called me just now and said, just go ahead and play, play it. On, uh, on the recording, and uh, so here's Barbara Streisand's on Holy Ground. You said I'm kidding, <laughs> So you may uh, leave at your convenience. Questions that you might have, yeah. Done here on the fifth floor, or yes. Was, was he moved? No, it was uh, done on the fifth floor. <coughs> yeah, it was done right on the fifth floor. In fact, uh, what happened? Uh, 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 Brother Cornelius moved that statue, which was in the lobby, up to the fifth floor during Holy Week, and put it in the, the corner, not in his room, and put it in the corner. And the fifth floor, people have stories about that. I wish Pat Lampy was here because Pat could tell you he got. They never used that, that room, and then again, this is the old hospital, they never used that room for any patient. They only used it as a storage room. And that was room 527? That, you got it. With orthopedic supplies? Yes, sure you got it. To go get stuff out That's it. right. Yeah, Pat Lampy once got stuck in there, and oh, it scared him half to death. <laughs> I can't get out the door locked or something. Any? You had asked a question about the fifth floor, and you know, we're not talking about this building. Correct, the old building. The old building, right. And, and nothing exists any longer of the old building. We're just standing where it used to stand. 
I'm sorry to rush through this quickly with you, but, uh, and I know you all have places to go and people to take care of. And what you do is appreciated. And, yes? So I work over at the college. Uh -huh. In our lobby, there's a, a very large picture. Would that have been the picture of the actual building that sat here? Yes. Okay. Yeah. 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 Where, where we're at uh, in St. Uh, St. Louis University? No, Lutheran. Huh? Lutheran School of Nursing. Oh, Lutheran School of Nursing. I, I'm not sure. No, I, I don't know. I can't imagine it's got to be a Lutheran. Yeah. yeah. We didn't cross the two. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Either. So anyway, that, do you have any questions at all? I have a comment. Okay. Uh, when Brother John was here, stationed here, I was in pastoral yeah. care. Right. And he said he was actually in the room and yes. spent time with him. Yeah, I'm so glad but you brought But nothing it. happened. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up because he, here's what Brother John on his deathbed said, I want to have a documentary, something done to show what the brothers did. It wasn't just these priests, these Jesuits that did a lot of stuff. The brothers did 24-hour care. They were spit at, they were uh, urinated on and everything. And because and all these different things happened where uh, like a, a, this, a tray, you know, would be, and all of a sudden, the, the plate on the tray would just sweep across the room. So the brothers were, you know, and then they were on the floor and they and the boy was rustling with some of them during during his these seizures and stuff. So uh, the brothers did an awful lot. And Brother John wanted to give have the brother which he was right. Get the brothers should get some credit for all that he done. So that was his deathbed wish and I said, I will do so. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. So um, may I ask, um, were these prayers of exorcism scenes that were said in Latin, and the brothers were reciting them? Who was doing the prayer? It was the prayers of exorcism. It was the uh, Father Bodern and some of the other, a few other priests that were around. So he was a, he's a Jesuit? Yeah, yeah. So they would come and pray these prayers that's, every, that's right. every day? That's right. Yeah, yeah, right. Every evening. Every yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there any truth to, before the wing was tore down on the fifth floor, there was a feeling of cold, different ones? There was like uh, a people have said that, that there seemed to be, you know, what happened was the room that he stayed in was never again used as a patient room. It was used as a supply room. In fact, uh, Dolores Lampy's son, uh, who was working here, remembers going in there because there was that was, all kinds of supplies were there. And what happened was he got locked in and he got a little bit <laughs> yeah. scared because he was locked in that room because no patient was ever in that room. It became a supply room where there was toilet tissue and what, whatever, all kinds of supplies were put in that room. We never used it for patients after that. How did he pay it out? Huh? How did he pay it out? He, oh, he pounded on the door. Finally, someone heard him and, and got him out. He might be here tonight if he is. He can explain what happened. <laughs>